gain your judgment, God. That's what a lot of people say, and it becomes a problem when God does gain his judgment. We say, well, wait a minute, God, why did you do that? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hemp. And I'm Janice. This program is called Quick Study Television. We're going through the Bible in one year. Psalm 108 to 112, that's what we study today. Corey, what are you doing? We are going to be taking a look at a very interesting site that was excavated in the city of Jerusalem. All right, I think that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And you did what today? We have our weekly Bible study on page five of your June pocket guide. So get that open. We're going to be having a discussion question from that. The pocket guide has in it these biblical guides and uh, we want to highlight that. We're doing that today. Ryan, what's up? Well, today I'm examining the life of the man who's known for his poor choice in real estate. I'm referring, of course, to Lot. Poor choice in real estate. <laughs> Very good. Get your Bible and let's go. Today, you and I are going to be looking at a, a really interesting archaeological excavation in Jerusalem. Uh, today, we call it Ketef Hinnom. It means the shoulder of the Hinnom Valley. So it's up on a hill, uh, and there have been some very interesting and important archaeological finds that directly impact uh, our understanding of the Bible. Take a look. In modern-day Jerusalem, a hill named Ketef Hinnom has yielded important archaeological finds. Ketef Hinnom means the shoulder of Hinnom, as it's located on the escarpment rising from the Hinnom Valley across from the old city of Jerusalem. Excavations between 1975 and 96 explored burial caves as well as a Byzantine church. And while the area had been used as a quarry during the Turkish Ottoman period, resulting in extensive damage, the site has still produced rich finds. The church has been identified as St. George Outside the Walls, a church built for Christian pilgrims as they journeyed along the road between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. According to an historical source, many Christian clergymen were murdered here in the Persian invasion of Christian Jerusalem. Below the remains of the church, archaeologists discovered cremation remains and a stamped roof tile, evidence of the 10th Roman Legion, who are known to have been stationed in Jerusalem for a couple hundred years from the time of the destruction of the temple onwards. Even earlier still, many graves were explored from the Second Temple period and several tombs from the First Temple period. These rock-cut tombs show evidence of continued use into the Roman period, with artifacts ranging from decorative beads to signet seals and cooking pots. The ceilings of the tombs had been quarried away in ancient times, but the burial benches and general layouts of the tombs have been left intact. In these and other Judean tombs from the First Temple period, rock-cut benches, sometimes with headrests showing the orientation the deceased would have been laid, provided space for the decomposition of the body. Once decomposed, family members would collect the bones and grave goods from the bench and deposit them in a bone repository, often located under one of the benches, to make way for more burials. In one tomb, archaeologists discovered a bone repository that was intact, untouched by looters thanks to rock debris that had covered it for thousands of years. Within it, the remains of 95 people were found, along with over a thousand artifacts and the largest collection of jewelry found to date. This repository also yielded the now famous Silver Scroll Amulets. So there we have it, the really interesting layers of Ketef Hinnom that, that touch on Christian history in the Byzantine area and this unexpected find, the Byzantine church, and then all the way back down to, uh, to the first temple period, so during the time period of the kings, and how astounding and amazing it is that archaeologists were able to find this perfectly preserved, untouched bone repository. And from that, you know, not only that, that large, uh, um, you know, find of jewelry, but over a thousand artifacts, including um, different pots and, and earthenware vessels, uh, um, um, weapons were found as well, arrowheads, different things like that, that really shed light on what people thought was important. Uh, you know, you bury, you bury your dead, you bury your loved ones with things that were important to them or are important to you as a family. So this is a really interesting thing to be able to find this time capsule, because really 
that is what it is uh, there. And of course, the extremely famous, famous silver scroll amulets were also found in this cache as well. And we've done studies on those uh, before on the quick study program. Uh, but basically, they, put, they solidify an earlier date for the writing of the scriptures because they contain uh, portions of numbers and Deuteronomy. And some people had thought that, you know, numbers and Deuteronomy were written after the Babylonian exile. This solidifies it quite before. God's judgment is always right, no matter how we feel about it. <laughs> to discover the rightness of God, we must review His Word. God always makes His case according to His Word. But His Word cannot be properly translated unless the Spirit of God helps us. This is the key to understanding the Bible. It is written to all of us, you and me, but many see the Bible as written for others, not themselves. We take more authority from our own opinions than from the Word of God. When we say, Lord God, gain your judgment, we call on Him to come into a situation and to do His perfect will. One thing we must always keep in mind as we travel through the pages of the Bible, it is for us. We must pay attention to what it says and how it says it so we can apply it to ourselves and not judge others. Psalm 109 verses 1 through 13. Do not keep silent, O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers, but I give myself to prayer. Thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. Set a wicked man over him, and let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, let him be found guilty, and let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few, and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless, and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Let the creditor seize all that he has, and let strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any to favor his fatherless children. Let his posterity be cut off, and in the generation following, let their name be blotted out. Psalm 109, verses 1. Through 13. You know, uh, we talk about the Psalms as pieces of music, and I love it because the music is always truthful. It's one thing to be inspired and write a piece of music for a woman. Many people are writing for pets. Some people are writing for situations. Quite a different thing to be inspired by the Word of God and to be inspired by the Holy Spirit and write that way. Well, the people who wrote Psalms were inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit spoke to them. So they began to read it. Here is how Psalm 109 talks. It, it's, it's amazing. It says, first one, it, it, this is called, help me, O Lord, my God. That's what it's called. It says, be not silent, O God of my praise. Don't be silent, God of my praise. I praised you, God. Don't be silent. That is an amazing statement. The Holy Spirit tells us to pray like that. Really? 
Absolutely, beloved. As we focus on this, I need you to get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage and also get your Bible. That's the most important book you'll ever read and turn. If you don't have a Bible guide, by the way, you can use the addresses at the bottom or you can use www.biblediscoverytv.com. Go there and click on donate, make a donation in any amount because we sure could use it. And uh, pray about it, ask God what he would have you do and so on and get yourself into the Bible guide, very important. Now, as we read this, there's only one thing to do, and that is ways of truth. Ways of truth is a way I articulate what we're going to be talking about. The ways of truth are this. Gain your judgment, God. That's serious. Gain your judgment, God. You say, but Rod, nobody's supposed to judge. God doesn't want anybody to judge. Yeah, that's us. We're not to judge others. But God is different than us. Jesus Christ was fully human, true. And he said, don't judge lest you be judged. But he himself is going to judge. Now that's very interesting. As we look at this, we begin to understand God is different. He's so much higher than we are. His emotions are perfect and so on. We read Psalm 108 to 112 and we're looking at Psalm 109 verses 1 to 13. Lord, I want to pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would hear you. We would listen to Psalm 109, that you would begin to speak to our hearts what we need to do and how we need to do it. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. As we prepare ourselves for the reading of God's word, listen carefully to the first verse in Psalm 109. Do not keep silent, O God of my praise. Do not keep silent. O God of my praise, for the mouth of the wicked and the mouth of the deceitful have opened against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred. They've surrounded me with words of hatred. Now that's interesting because we have a lot of hate speech going on today, but it's very interesting. We'll talk about that in a minute. And fought against me without a cause. In return for my love, they are my accusers. But I give myself to prayer. I give myself to prayer. Listen to this. We must give ourselves to prayer when surrounded by false accusations. Now, I talked about hate speech, and a lot of people talked. I remember the sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Remember that? Never has there been such a lie as that. <laughs> I mean, we used to say that to make ourselves strong so that when we're called things at school, it wouldn't affect us, but it does. And we've recognized that, as the Bible said. But the problem is, when we begin to articulate hate speech and all of that stuff, we get into trouble with it. The Bible tells us to pray, it says, I want you to go to God. I want you to listen to the Lord because hate speech and all that comes from evil, evil. And you can't stop evil with laws of man. You stop evil with love to God. That's how you stop evil. You come to God and allow him to work through you. Now that's very important, beloved. So we go back to Psalm 109 verse five. It says, thus they have rewarded me evil for good and hatred for my love. So that's interesting. Verse six says, set a wicked man over him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is judged, when he is judged, let him be found guilty and let his prayer become sin. Wow. Never knew that a prayer could become sin. If it's not prayed the right way, listen carefully. Let his prayer become sin. Let his days be few and let another take his office. Let his children be fatherless and his wife a widow. Let his children continually be vagabonds and beg. Let them seek their bread also from their desolate places. Man, that is really something. When we pray against the evil persecuting us, we must be honest with God about what we're asking for. A lot of people are like, well, I prayed, you know, and I prayed that God would help me and I prayed that he would do this and do that. And, and he didn't. That's because we didn't really pray what we prayed, what we felt 
but not really what we wanted. Sometimes, many times, oftentimes, we feel, but it's not really what we want. We need to, to listen to the Lord, take time and say, Lord, help me here. And then the Holy Spirit will help us interpret it because God is helping us. And when we do that, we'll become wiser when we pray. Psalm 103, verse 11 says, let the creditor seize all that he has. Let the strangers plunder his labor. Let there be none to extend mercy to him, nor let there be any favor to his fatherless children. That's amazing. Let his posterity be cut off. And in the generation following, let there be a name blotted out. What does that mean? Evil follows generations. When we come to Christ being born again, that's what born again means. Jesus coined that phrase in John chapter three. When we come to Christ, evil is cut off. That's why Jesus said that. We must be born again. We must recognize that being born again means we have a new heritage. And that's important for us to believe and understand. Otherwise, we, we're always the same if we're not born again. And we always blame our past because our past did this and our past, that person abused me. That person did this to me. 30 years down the line, that person did this. You know, we, we don't need to do that because when we come to Jesus Christ, first of all, his Holy Spirit is all powerful and is able to heal us. Secondly, we need to remember that and we need to allow ourselves to be open to the Holy Spirit of God and the Spirit of God will speak to us and the Spirit of God, God will heal us when we come to Jesus Christ. There are 150 psalms, and they all tell us to sing something, and that is praise the Lord. That's right, praise the Lord. We're going to explore that and much more next time on Quick Study Television. Make sure to join us, Ryan. Well, over the last two episodes of Quick Study, we've examined the lives of both Abraham and his wife, Sarah. So today, I thought it would be fitting to also look at the life of their nephew, Lot. Now, he's famously known for his poor choice in real estate, because, of course, he chose to live at Sodom, which was a place of great wickedness. Later, when God decided to utterly destroy that place, he provided the unsuspecting Lot with a means of escape. God was not going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. His name was Lot. He was the son of Abraham's brother, Haran, who were the sons of Terah. So Lot was Abraham's nephew. And this would later prove to be an important connection for Lot, since his father Haran died prematurely. Thus Abraham apparently took Lot under his wing, a good match since Lot had no father and Abraham and his wife Sarah had no children. Lot journeyed with his uncle for quite some time. By the time that they came to rest in Canaan, Lot and Abraham were so prosperous that the land could no longer support them both. Indeed, as nomads, they lived on the outskirts of the city and with the Canaanites and Perizzites dwelling in the land, there was limited space for their flocks and herds. So Abraham asks Lot to separate from him and even offers him the first choice of the land. When Lot looks off to the east, he sees the richly luscious and very well watered plain of the Jordan. It seemed to be the prime choice. However, what Lot seems to have not realized is that the people there were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. So while Abraham remained in Canaan, Lot moved eastward and dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. 
For now, Lot would continue in his nomadic lifestyle. But eventually, he would move into the city, and even become a citizen and elder of Sodom, one who sat at the gate of the city. In fact, on one particular evening, while Lot was sitting at this gate, he sees two men approaching the city. Knowing just how dangerous the streets of Sodom are, Lot offers them lodging. There, they feast and have fellowship, but before bedtime, all the men of Sodom surrounded Lot's house and demanded that he bring out the two men so that they can have homosexual relations with them. Word of these two men had spread fast. At this point, Lot goes out to plead with them not to commit this horrendous act, and even goes so far as to offer them his own two virgin daughters. But they only got more violent. With Lot now in extreme danger, the two men pull him back into the house, shut the door, and eliminate the threat by striking the surrounding mob with blindness and confusion. Though up to this point, Lot seemingly did not know that he had been entertaining angels, their identity and the purpose of their visit was now made known. With the destruction of the city eminent, Lot attempts to warn his other family members, but they do not believe him. In the end, Lot escaped with his two daughters, but his wife was lost when she lingered to look at the destruction and perhaps got caught in the superheated spray of minerals. She became a pillar of salt. His two daughters would later get him drunk and each become pregnant by him in order to preserve their family line. Now, what Lot did in attempting to offer up his own daughters up to these men was unacceptable, and a lot could be said on that. But it's important to remember that God still considered Lot righteous. Remember Abraham's question to God, would you also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Well, the answer to that is obviously no, and God indeed saves Lot. In fact, he offered to save Lot's entire family. Though Lot made mistakes in his life, the Bible in 2 Peter 2 makes it clear that he was considered righteous. One Bible commentator describes Lot this way, He was weak and he sinned, but he did love the Lord. He did try to call out the people of Sodom for their sin by reminding them that they were doing wicked deeds, and he tried to protect his angelic visitors. He may have been an ineffective evangelist, but he was burdened and grieved over the sin he saw around them. And yet, uh, I mean, it's true that Lot really made some bad decisions, and there's no question about that. And it's very interesting. Good report, Ryan. Thank you so much. Uh, I just wanted to say quickly that we're going to go ahead and extend the offer. Uh, this is a world by design. Yeah. Tell us about that real quick. Well, if you've been watching the program over the last few months, you've seen clips of me interviewing uh, researchers, scientists, and speakers. Now, this was from a 2017 Creation Super Conference in Ontario, Canada. And uh, so we've made them available in their full forms, completely uh, unedited, uncut. And uh, this is over three hours of material included on this disc is Dr. Carl Werner, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, Vance Nelson, Michael Ord, Dr. John Sanford, and Dr. Stuart Burgess. So it's a really, really great lineup. We had a great time doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would really recommend this. this is a great, great tool. And um, for a gift of $60 or more, we'd love to send it your way. And it really is good for your library, but it's also good if you want to give it to somebody and to start the discussion happening in your household. It helps you to understand, and th these are scientists. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. what do you do? You talk about a scientist. So these are good people, and the, just, just a few. There's yeah. many more scientists who do this. All right. Today, we're going to have our Bible discussion from our weekly Bible study. Every seven days of reading, you will find in your pocket guide a weekly Bible study. Now, it happens from the beginning of the year, so every seventh day. So you'll notice in the June guide, it will be on page five. It's our weekly Bible study from Psalms 77 to 107. And today I'm going to pick number three for us to discuss. You have not heard this before. Nope. Um, this is, the Bible says, we are to number our days to gain a heart of wisdom. This is what Psalm 90 says. The Bible says we are to number our days to gain a heart of wisdom. How do we do this when everything indicates that we should have our best life now? Mm. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, it, it, it depends on how you define best life now, uh, because we do only get one life here on earth. So in that sense, when the Psalms tell us to number our days, remembering how short life is and then deciding how we want to spend our life is a point well taken. It, I, think, I think that 
really does line up. So, you know, if, if you're following Christ, you, you need to follow Christ and that becomes your best life. So, so yeah, it involves sacrifice, but it involves a tremendous amount of joy in, in the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and God gives you desires in your heart that you see so that you, you get to see here on earth and, you know, some dreams you believe will be fulfilled, uh, in the new heavens and the new earth, but some, so you know, it just depends on how you define that. If you define like giving me everything I want in terms of the best life now, that's very bad. And, it, 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 I, and I, I say bad because that's not what Christ did. And that's not how we see the Christian life modeled by the apostles. Because um, there's so much more to life than just getting what you think you want. Mm -hmm. And what you, you know? need and what you, what you want uh, becomes intermixed when you get into situations where you, I, I need a new iPhone, you mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. Do you need it or do you want it? Yeah. You know, I mean, that's those are questions that we ask ourselves, yeah. and we're we're told the commercials tell us, "So well, we got to have this. We got to have this. It's gonna mm -hmm. make us happy." Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important. What about you, Ryan? Yeah, no, I, I just I I agree with that. I think if we set our minds on things above, and we we really, really understand that there is another life, mm -hmm. and it's it's way better than this one because if this is all there is, well. <laughs> You know, that's, that's a rip-off. Have a blast yeah. while you last. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But no, I, I personally look very forward to that. And that's that's been, I guess, where the Lord has been leading me personally, mm -hmm. is less away from the carnal life here and less about this life here and reminding me to build up his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so my prayer is, Lord, help me to do that. Help me to know how to build up your kingdom. Because mm -hmm. oftentimes we're so, we're so blinded by our lives here, we can't think past ourselves. We mm -hmm. can't think past our lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, think it's, I think it's a challenge, but I think it's something we have to pray about. Yeah. What about you, Mom? Well, I think that as I, as I get older, 56 this year, and I see life different, I'm beginning to see life differently, especially after becoming uh, grandparents as well. You, you realize that when I was, when I became a mother, I was concerned and had worries about certain things that I thought was very important. And with a minute left, I, I would just capsulize it into as I'm aging, I see the, 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 the quality in loving people. Mm -hmm. in relationships, that that's really what's important and that we need to be loving towards one another. And that's what God extended to us was his love as well. And, and these are the things that we can take with us into the afterlife, into eternity. We take people. It's people that we bring mm -hmm. and, and the gifts that God has given us. It's not the things that we work for. And so I think that that has changed in my heart. I think over that's the years. great. Hmm. That is what excellent answers can we ask for except these. That is really good. And uh, the Bible studies are for you to consider doing a Bible study in your own home. That's just one. There's three questions and three comments there, and uh, there's three ways to do the Bible study. So we encourage you get your Bible guide today.